I'm here to talk today about the, the F word. Um, everybody has one. What's yours? Do you have an, do you have an F word? <laughs> I, well, I have several, actually. F words. I'm here to talk about the F word. I'm not here to talk about faith, although that actually is one of my F words. I'm, I'm not here to talk about fashion, although I am a fashion designer by profession. No, my F word is a really, really important ingredient in my life, my creative process, my business. And when I look back on my life, the F word has been with me at various times throughout my life. I was really nervous about speaking with you today. I, um, I don't know, I was just like, I was really nervous. And, uh, and then I realized that I didn't need to be nervous because what I'm actually going to talk to you about is my F word is failure. And so if I'm going to talk about the importance of failure in my creative process, then I have to be prepared to fail right here, right now on this stage. And everything will still be okay, right? So I'm going to tell you my story and about how failure has been woven into my life story together with my successes. You may have heard of my successes, but I doubt that you heard about my failures. So I'm going to tell you the real story now today. This is me at the age of three. I was born in Sterrett Olson, Ontario. Anybody know where Sterrett Olson is? You do? Oh my gosh, you're kidding. <laughs> you must be from Red Lake then. Bombertown, oh my gosh. Well, okay, I was born actually in Red Lake at the hospital there, but we lived in Sterrett Olson in a house that my dad built out of logs that he cut down, skinned, and made the house. Then we moved to Koshiner, and um, that's where I lived till I was 17. We moved to Winnipeg. Anyway, so the bottom line is, at the age of three, in 1954, you can get out your calculators and figure out how old I am. <laughs> My mom let me play with her Singer sewing machine. Anybody recognize this machine? Yeah, you remember seeing one of those in your house? It was always on the, on the kitchen table, uh, came in a little box. My mom uh, got it out of Eaton's catalog. By the way, for those of you who are younger than 30, uh, there used to be this company called Eaton's. <laughs> And um, they sent out a catalog twice a year, and that catalog had everything in it. And I didn't want to wear the same clothes as everybody else bought from Eaton's catalog. So at the age of three, I started to sew, and my mom let me use her Singer Featherweight sewing machine. By the time I was, okay, 51, nine, nine <laughs> um, I was sewing my outfits. In fact, I. My first outfit I made, one of the first outfits I made, I never did doll clothes. I made myself, I went for grade one, I made myself a skin-tight skirt with a slit up the back. It was orange corduroy. And I wore those, you know those little plastic high heels with the sparkles in them and the elastic over the toe? That's what I wore to grade one. <laughs> By the time I was nine, I was, um, I entered a sewing contest and I won with this cute little outfit. Look at that, isn't that cute? It's got a dolman sleeve, a pair of pants made from cotton chino. I loved to sew. I made a lot of mistakes, but that was okay. My mom just let me sew. She let me cut into fabric, even if I didn't know what I was doing and some things didn't turn out. That was my first introduction to the F word, failure. I failed at more things than I succeeded at when I was sewing at home, but nothing bad ever happened at home. One of my favorite things was going out on Red Lake and fishing for pickerel. You know, we'd go out fishing and we'd fill up our deep freeze with pickerel and jackfish and ducks and geese and deer and moose, and it would last us through the whole winter. And I always remember fishing season actually starts just before exams, right? And we'd be out every night of the week on the lake, fishing, sometimes up till 
all hours of the night because we had to fill it those pickerel. And I remember um, being very young and learning how to fill it a pickerel. And you know, there's a way to fill it so there's no bones. And guess how many pickerel I had to fill it before I got the knack of it? Quite a few. There was quite a few raggedy fillets. But nothing bad ever happened when I failed, as long as I was learning something in the process. So I had this experience at home of failure being OK, because I didn't even see it was failure. It was just my mom and dad's way of learning, of teaching us. Consequently, by the time I graduated from high school, well, you know, I worked hard. I did. Uh, sometimes the night before a history exam, I'd be up until 3 o'clock in the morning making myself an outfit to wear to the <laughs> history exam. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so to, to, to graduate from high school with a 53% average meant that I didn't, you know, I didn't do poorly in everything, but I did really poorly in some things, and I did quite well in some other things, so added up with a 53% average. And, and this whole concept that failure was a really bad thing began to enter my life. And I began to feel ashamed of my academic record. I didn't want to go to university. I hated school. Couldn't wait to get out. With a 53% average, I was accepted into Sheridan College in their fashion design program. <laughs> Boy, I was really good at sewing and designing things and making things. And finally, I was in a school where that was appreciated. And I started to succeed. After a stint in Europe as an apprentice at a house, a fashion house in London and another one in the south of France, I came back to Toronto thinking after this wonderful education and this European experience, I felt good. You know, I felt like really good. And I couldn't get a job. Again, failure came knocking on my door. And I couldn't get a job. I was 23 years old, unemployed in Toronto, and I had to make a living. So I started my own company. Now, if, if I had gotten a job, who knows what might have happened. But I couldn't get a job, so I had to make a job. Started Linda Lundstrom Limited in 1974 in a two-bedroom apartment with a $10,000 loan from my mom and dad. My dad was a miner. Those were 10,000 very hard-earned dollars that they trusted me with. And they never, ever, ever asked me how I was spending them. Again, I had nothing but support from my family and tolerance for failure. And yet, I felt in the outside world, I was being judged constantly. In 1974, I started the company, and it grew. It grew from that two-bedroom apartment, grew to a larger premises. And as the company was growing, that $10,000 was no longer adequate to finance the growth of the company. And I started having cash flow problems. I didn't really know what cash flow problems were, uh, but my bank did. <laughs> And my bank started calling me all the time, talking about margins. And I, I didn't have the nerve to ask them what a margin was. But now I know that my receivables were not adequate uh, to cover the line of credit that they had extended me. And I could feel the failure kind of breathing down my neck because of this margin problem. So I had the opportunity to go to Japan a friend of mine who was going there to um, develop fabrics. I went to Japan, and it changed my life. 
I saw designers like Ray Kawakubo uh, come to Garcon, Izzy Miyake, anyone who know Izzy Miyake? Um, um, Yoji Yamamoto. These designers were just bursting onto the international fashion scene. And what I saw was that their designs were variations on the ancient kimono. And I came back from Japan and I said, what can I make that is as Canadian as the kimono is Japanese? That was one thing I, I asked myself. The second thing I asked myself is, how can I solve my cash flow problem that happens every May and June? And then I was visited by a vision. I was visited by a vision that kept coming back over and over and over again of a figure walking across a horizon. Actually, she was walking this way, walking across a horizon and the color of her, and, she, and the garment had fur here, a pointed hood, and the color of the garment changed with the color of the sun, the, the sky behind her. And it was a parka. Well, we all grew up wearing parkas, didn't we? But I thought, is this going to solve my cash flow problem in May and June? So I called up a, a retailer and I said, um, what do you take delivery of in May and June? And they said, well, we really like to get our winter coats in nice and early. There was the answer to my, my failure to meet the demands of my bank. So I started making La Parca. And uh, I didn't tell my bank <laughs> that I was going to buy fabric and machinery and everything to make this La Parca. And I called it La Parca because my dad was from Lapland in northern Sweden. And the indigenous people there wear a, a, a layered decorated garment, and the Inuit wear a parka. And so I put the two words together, la parka. In 1993, we were making lots of la parkas. And I started collaborating with Native artists, First Nations arti uh, artists. And one of the reasons that I collaborated with First Nations artists was not for the reason you might think, because I wanted to make a beautiful garment. I collaborated with them because I had guilt and shame about growing up in Red Lake and participating and witnessing, participating in and witnessing racism and not doing anything about it. I participated through my silence. And when I had my own first child, I became aware of this failure in my life, this shame that was buried deep in my conscience. And the only way I could, could try to make amends was to reach out to artists like Abe Kakapitam, who I went to school with in Goshener, Ontario. Um, and this actually is one of Abe's designs, and Abe is in our audience today. Um, he lives in Thunder Bay now, and this is called a uh, Native Son by Abe Kakapitam. And when I first introduced the native art motifs, they didn't sell. They failed to sell. But I kept them in the line in spite of the fact that they weren't selling. And within five years, the native art motifs were selling equally as well as the plain laparkas. Uh, how many of you know what a, a laparka is and seen it around? Just yeah. All you have to do, <laughs> go to recess, at, uh, go to a schoolyard at recess in the middle of winter and you'll see a teacher on yard duty. So here I am, I've got this wildly successful product. We're selling thousands of them all over North America. I have a husband that's joined me in the company. I have two beautiful daughters, Moshe and Sophie. It's 1994, I'm winning awards. I'm winning awards. I have three honorary doctorates and you know, that imposter syndrome, when I was going up to accept my award, I kept thinking, geez, I hope they didn't check my marks in high school. <laughs> uh, maybe by the time I get up to the podium, they'll, they'll say, excuse me, but we just Googled your whatever, and we're going to take that award back. Um, anyway, so, so I was at the height of my success, winning all these awards. I even won an award for mental health in the workplace. And that was just when I had my nervous breakdown. 
I had 150 employees. I had three corporately owned stores. We were selling to 400 retailers throughout North America. And one day I went to my doctor to find out why I didn't feel well. I couldn't find a parking spot. And I had a complete breakdown. So it's about failure happening I had failed. I was taking care of everyone else's mental health, but I had failed to take care of my own. My relationships were great, but my relationship with myself was crappy. I was pushing myself. I wasn't exercising. I wasn't eating properly. I was just pushing, pushing, pushing. And um, I've been on medication ever since. Prozac saved my life. I had to take some time off and rethink everything. And my therapist said to me, Linda, what do you need? What do you need to feed your soul? And I said, I need to swim in a lake. That's what I need. So we bought a property outside of Toronto called Green Lake. And we began to go there on weekends, and it saved my life. We continued to sell the park and the whole product line that went with it. In 1997, we, we the, our sales had gone to $13 million, part of which was La Parca. Then there was the boots, the muffs, the head muffs, everything that went with it. This is another design by Abe Kakapitam. We had to move to larger premises. We moved to a 60,000 square foot state-of-the-art manufacturing facility with lots and lots of room and computerized CAD chem equipment, state-of-the-art everything. Um, oh, Olivia Newton-John. Olivia Newton-John, just a little name drop there, um, <laughs> wore, wore one of my La Parkas to, uh, for the cover of her Christmas album. And in 2006, we celebrated 20 years of La Parka, and I made this um, special uh, La Parka to, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of La Parka. And um, it's called Okechitakwe. Um, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but Okechitakwe is means warrior woman, peacekeeping, peacekeeper in the Ojakri language. And uh, this is the motif that was the last really great Laparka that I made. Because after that, the journey that started back in Starrett Olson, that started with a parka. <laughs> and took me on that journey. And when I look back on the journey and all the things that happened, the successes and the failures were interwoven. And my, when I look back on it now, I realize that my greatest successes, La Parca, came from my greatest failures, my cash flow. When I look at my greatest successes, being able to have a place like Green Lake came from my, my breakdown. What seemed like a failure at the time was actually necessary for me to experience a successful event in my life. And that's my message for you today. Because in 2008, after 35 years in business, 34 years in business, my bank called my loan. They gave me uh, 30 day, gave us 30 days to pay back $2 million. And I decided that I had realized everything I set out to do. I sold my company. I sold my name. We, w we were forced into bankruptcy. Now, when failure comes banging down your door in the form of bankruptcy, it's really hard to let them in. But this time, I said, okay, you've been circling around me all these years. Come on in, sit down. What do I have to do? Because I wanted to get past this to the success. And, and failure said to me, well, you can keep your cabin at Green Lake, but you're going to lose everything else. So I did. I, I agreed. And we moved. In 2010, we moved to our cabin. It was not insulated, a wood stove, and this construction trailer became my studio. I began to uh, snowshoe on the lake. 
I began to swim every day that I could, sometimes with a wetsuit. I began to work with fur and leather. My daughters were my models. This is my eldest daughter, Moshe. This is my youngest daughter, Sophie. I began to connect with the First Nations people I were, was friends with in Red Lake, and I began to help them to source fabrics and jingles for their regalia for the powwows. And in the process of, of connecting with my roots back in Red Lake, I began to realize that what I really love to do is I really love to share my knowledge, and it was time for me to share my knowledge. I began to conduct workshops, and that has led me to my latest project. Today, I am... Um, really excited about all the failures that I know are in my future to bring the sewing circle to reality. And it's a way for Northern First Nations communities to use me and my ability to source everything they need to create the capability to make their own clothing. I had a wonderful meeting yesterday with some First Nations leaders, and I'm hoping that this will become a reality. Stay tuned. I am also launching an outerwear line. So for those of you who are looking for some new Linda Lundstrom outerwear, my daughters and I, my daughters came to me and said, Mom, we're going to want to launch an outerwear line with you for 2017. Stay tuned. It's going to be called Coattails. My message is, failure is part of life. What are you waiting for? Go out and fail, and fail big. Thank you. <laughs>